morning, everyone, and welcome to Bonner Springs United Methodist Church. It's so good to see you guys this morning. I'm Pastor Catherine, and this is Pastor Andy, and well, Pastor Charles is in the balcony running lots, uh, lots of good things for us, and I'm going to start us off with our announcements this week. So if you guys could turn to the back of your bulletins this week, last week I mentioned that we had six new study classes opening uh, and I just kind of mentioned them to you, but here are all the details. So we're encouraging you guys to think about signing up for a study. Um, we're starting one for just about every single age group, so you can definitely find a place to fit in. Um, you'll also notice confirmation is starting if you have a kid, a grandkid, a, a neighbor, niece or nephew that you think might want to do that. That is for generally 6th through 12th graders. We encourage kids to think about it in 7th, 8th, and ninth grade going through it. And I might be asking some of you guys, or if you've done it in the past, we um, pair up the kids with a mentor from the congregation who will listen to their questions about faith, their doubts about faith, and be there to support them um, on a retreat and at confirmation day. So if that's something you've never done and you'd like to try, it's really cool to get to talk to these kids. Um, and it's, it's a pretty uh, low commitment as far as time commitment. It's just being available to them. Um, the rest of them are just all classes you can sign up for. And then I also want to let you guys know um, that there is a blood drive the 21st from 11 to 4 in the fellowship hall. I am always so proud when I walk through the blood drive to see you guys being so brave, uh, giving blood. And so uh, we love that we can be a place uh, that continues to donate here. Some of you are interested in helping with Bonner Builders that will uh, fix things up in the community, houses that need it. Uh, there was a work day that was scheduled that's been rescheduled. So if you had that on your calendar, just stay in touch with Andy and he will let you know when that new date will be. Choir rehearsal resumes next Wednesday, August 31st at 7.30 p.m. Woohoo! Woo Contact Lyra if you're interested or just show up. It's generally good if you can sing a little bit, um, <laughs> but uh, other than that, they would love to have you. And then also, I'm going to have you guys turn to the inside of the communication card. Um, we're inviting you guys every week to fill these out just so we can kind of keep track of everybody. Um, but there are three opportunities to serve God each week that are here, ways you can volunteer. So this week, we're still looking for dehumidifiers for the Edwardsville after school program that we can use through the warm months. And then also, um, we are having our organization and cleaning day for the Edwardsville After School Program. And that is August 31st. There are two time slots. One is from 9 to noon, and one is from 3 to 6. This is organizing and cleaning and setting up educational stations. So if you have any history in education, this isn't going to be lifting or painting or nailing or anything like that. So... Uh, we would love some help for that. I have two pictures. You can kind of see them. So the, the after-school program starts September 7th, and this is what it looks like right now. So, I mean, I would really love help because otherwise it's just me doing that. Uh, and so we're going to get the heavy stuff moved out of there, and we have plans for the station and people shopping and donations, but we need some organization. So I hope those pictures motivate you. Uh, let me know. And then we also need people to sign up to tutor who have been through safe gatherings. That was, uh, there was a link for that in the midweek, and I will also be emailing those of you who have said you had interest, uh, the specific email actually during worship or right after worship today so you'll have that in your inbox. Those are my announcements uh, today. Let's stand and greet our neighbor with the love and peace of Christ. return to your seats, remain standing, and we're going to sing together, I am thine, O Lord.
may be seated at this time, um, I'm going to invite my friend uh, and congregant, Jeremy Fisher, up. He's going to share with us the song, Wayfaring Stranger. Um, I'm thankful that he's here to play for us today. He's in our young adult uh, Bible study and book study, and you guys might know his, his cute kids that run around here, his wonderful wife, Shannon. Um, so we're thankful to have you this morning, Jeremy. And you need my mic. I can arrange that because I'm definitely not going to sing Wayfaring Stranger. I don't know it. Thank you, Catherine. So I haven't done anything like this in uh, probably about 30 years. <laughs> and Andy put me up to it. So there are two things to take away. One, never tell Andy your hobbies. He will exploit them. And two, uh, if I stink, it's his fault. So. Sickness, no toil, no danger in that bright land to which I go. I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there no more to roam. Just go in over Judy. I am just go in over home. I know dark clouds will gather over me. I know my pathways rough and steep. The golden fiends arise before me Where weary eyes no more shall we I'm going there to see my mother She said she'd mean me when I come I'm just going over Jordan. I am just going over home. I'll soon be free from every trial. This form will rest beneath the sun. Drop my cross of self-denial And enter in my home with God I'm going there to see my Savior Who shed for me his precious blood Going over Jordan, I am just going over home. I am just going over Jordan, I am just going over.
Johnny Cash, everyone. Yeah. Johnny Cash. It definitely didn't suck, Jeremy. That was good. <laughs> I, okay, so you said I had to take the credit if it went bad. Does that mean I get the credit since it went well? Okay, no, okay. Uh, Jeremy's one of those guys that's good enough at everything he does. I'm like, sure, I'm sure he'll do great. And you did. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, I'm now going to invite our kids to come forward for our children's time. a seat somewhere up here anywhere maybe thank you friends here I'll sit right here okay good morning how are you guys how is school now that you're back and you had your first full week back good you're playing woof woof okay Chase okay we have an announcement do you guys know who Miss Stephanie is Who's Miss Stephanie? Can anybody point her out? Right there. Did you know that she has been working with you guys in the nursery for a whole year? Did you know that? Wow. That is, let's give her a quick round of applause for that. So she was super kind and decided that she was going to help you guys out and help watch you guys for a little bit. But today is her last day. Everybody say no. So we want to do something for Miss Stephanie. We want to tell her thank you. But first, before we tell her a big thank you from everyone, I want you to think, can you think of something that you like to do in the nursery with Miss Stephanie? Does anybody have any ideas? What do you like to play in the nursery with Miss Stephanie? Mac, what do you like to play in the nursery? Play Legos with Miss Stephanie. What else do you like to do with Miss Stephanie? Play cars with Miss Stephanie. What about, I know Candace, Candace likes to make um, smoothies for Miss Stephanie. Sticker crafts with Miss Stephanie. These are all fun things that we get to do with Miss Stephanie. So we want to tell her a big thank you, okay? So I have a card that we're all going to, when we go back, we're all going to sign it and say thank you to Miss Stephanie. But right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three, and we're all going to say thank you, Miss Stephanie. Big kids and little kids, okay? Grown-ups and kids. Can we do that? Ready? One, two, three. Thank you, Miss Stephanie. So we have um, a little card from the church, and we've got a kid's card that we will sign when we go back there. But we think it's important in the church that when people do nice things that we say thank you. Thank Did you know that? Thank you. Thank you. Yep, that's important. So if you see Miss Stephanie around today, tell her thank you. Can you do that? You see her. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Everybody take, take a cue from Candace. Give Miss Stephanie a big high five or a hug and tell her thank you. Okay. Let's say a quick prayer. Let's say a quick prayer, a thank you prayer, and then we will go. Okay, my friends? Ready? Can you pray with me? Will you repeat after me? Dear God, thank you for today. And thank you for Miss Stephanie and all of the things she's done for us. We love you, God. Amen. All right. 
Friday, friends. Well, we are encouraging you, prepare yourselves, to open your Bible outside of church. Oh, wow. Um, and if you want a specific place to look this week during this sermon series, it's going to be in 1 Corinthians, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and read 1 Corinthians chapter 8 to you guys. Now concerning meat, excuse me, <laughs> that has been sacrificed to a false god, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes people arrogant, but love builds people up. If anyone thinks they know something, they don't, know, you know, they don't yet know as much as they should know. But if someone loves God, then they're known by God. So concerning the actual food involved in these sacrifices to false gods, we know that a false god isn't anything in the world, and that there's no god except the one true God. But not everybody knows this. Some are eating this food as though it really is food sacrificed to a real idol, because they were used to idol worship until now. Their conscience is weak because it has been damaged. Uh, food won't bring us close to God. We've been missing out on what we eat, and we don't have the advantage if we do eat. But watch out, or else the freedom of yours might be a problem for those who are weak. Suppose someone sees you, the person who has knowledge, eating in the idol's temple. Won't the person with a weak conscience be encouraged to eat the meat sacrificed to false god? The weak brother or sister for whom Christ has died is destroyed by your knowledge. You sin against Christ if you sin against your brother and sister and they hurt your weak conscience in this way. This is why if food causes the downfall of a brother or sister, I won't eat meat ever again or else it may cause my brother or sister to fall. This is the word of God for the people of God. Will you bow with me? God, we thank you so much for, uh, for giving us this community here. We thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the reminder that it brings to us to make the most of being here together, of our relationships. God, give us a vision of what you're calling us to look like here as your people. In your name we pray. Amen. So, I like being right. Anybody out there like being right? <laughs> I, I see someone pointing to their partner very vigorously right now. Uh, no, nobody likes to be right as much as Andy does. I, I'm working on it, guys. Okay. Uh, uh, you can talk to those who know me best. Actually, you just did uh, in a call and response, uh, 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 an unplanned one in the service, and they will probably confirm this for you. Uh, my dad is in town this weekend. Wave, Wes Frazier. That's my dad right there. Uh, and if you happen to see him after the service, uh, he could probably confirm for you this is not something that just spontaneously happened in adulthood for me either. No, in fact, this is the version of me after lots of hard work on this particular vice of mine liking to be right. Growing up, I never drank. I didn't smoke. I didn't sow my wild oats. In fact, the only thing that really got me in trouble was this thing right here. <laughs> it was my mouth. Uh, I didn't even cuss either. It wasn't that. That's not how my mouth got me in trouble. I had a no cuss rule, and this is true. I didn't say my first curse word until I was in college, okay? Now, in the following years, I made up for lost time a little bit. <laughs> Never mind that. But even without the off-limits words, my mouth still got me into lots of trouble. Some of it was just the run-of-the-mill talking when I shouldn't be talking, right, in church or in class when I wasn't supposed to. Or some of it was using my voice intentionally to annoy those around me. Can I get an amen from those? Yeah, yeah, from my, my sister there. Uh, but, but the thing that got me in the very most trouble was this deep, burning desire to be right. If I were to get in conflict with one of my sisters, for example, even when they had done something to instigate, Lord knows I instigated more than my fair share, but they did occasionally, sometimes too. But even in the times that they instigated, oftentimes I'd end up being the one in the most trouble by a big margin by the end of the whole thing. 
Let's say one of my sisters took something of mine or wronged me in some way, and I would begin to protest. My parents would come in, give us both some talking to or minor consequence. Most of the time, my sisters would have the good sense enough to say, okay, uh, suffer the small consequence and move on, time served, right? Not me. Never. <laughs> if I didn't feel like I had done something wrong, and especially if I felt like I had been wrong somehow by my sister or the punishment that ensued, oh gosh, I would never shut up about it. I would state my case about how very right I was and how wronged I had been, and if I didn't feel I was being adequately heard, I would continue to restate my case until I felt adequately heard. And I would do so passionately enough that I would get grounded for a week. Then two weeks. Then I would tell them how I really felt and get grounded for a third week. And then when my parents got tired of grounding me, they'd say, okay, on top of the grounding, you get an hour of work. It's like, oh, okay, now I get an hour of work. I can do better than that. Then they'd give me two and three and then six or seven. Okay. And then after that, they'd move to taking something else away and then something else. And they would do this until they remembered who they were talking to. <laughs> Sometimes it took longer than others. They remembered that they could do or threaten anything legally within their limits as parents, and I would never stop stating my case. I just wouldn't do it. Now, as the parent of an equally strong-willed child or two, <laughs> I would like to, from the pulpit, since my, dad, <laughs> since my dad is here and this works well, I would like to formally issue an apology to my parents. <laughs> um, tr truly, just about anything that, I, uh, that, that uh, comes my way, I have coming. So. And as much as I try to avoid these power struggles in my own home, sometimes they just seem to still happen. <laughs> and partially because I still like being right. <laughs> I'm a work in progress, y'all. Yeah. But as someone with a lifelong history of striving to be right, I can speak to you today about this topic from a place of some experience. Most of my sermons I'm preaching to myself, it's especially true today. So what's wrong with wanting to be right? There are worse vices, aren't there? In fact, being right is something we're called to do, isn't it? Aren't we as the church called to be people of truth? Yeah. People who discern and guard God's truth, who share it faithfully with the world? How could this be wrong? And especially right now in our world, don't we need to rise up and share what's right? With so much conflict over issues in our world, with so much fighting and polarization, with so many people being led astray, we live in a world where anyone can have an online platform or newspaper. Just a little bit of charisma, rhetorical skill. People build sometimes big followings fast. Often, too, the more imbalanced and certain someone is, the more people seem to follow them. What the world needs is maybe just for the church to get certain about what we believe. For us to know what's right. To say it without compromise. For God's truth to cut through all the noise and set things right. Right? Well, let's consider what Paul is saying in the scripture today. Paul is addressing members of the church of Corinth. They're people who are stuck in conflict. And Paul is writing them to help set things right. From Paul's letters to these guys, you really get a cool insight into the fact that people always sucked. Church politics and infighting is nothing new. Our denomination, United Methodism, is in the midst of a schism, but we are not unique or special. The church in Corinth was infighting before it was cool. And put aside for a second the who actually cares about eating food sacrificed to idols or not? Who cares if we can do that? Because actually, maybe that's kind of a helpful thing about this passage. And it's all about something that we don't care about. Does anybody here care about whether or not you can eat food sacrificed to idols? It doesn't, it doesn't come up too regular, does it? But it's something that seemed so big to this church back then in Corinth. In fact, it was seemed so big to them, they needed Paul 
who was busy, you know, like spreading the gospel to all the world and writing about half of our New Testament. They needed that Paul to waste a precious chapter of our Holy Scripture on it. It's interesting to think about what we might make Paul waste a chapter on if he were to come talk to us today, the generations to come would later on say, those silly forebears of mine and their weird hang-ups on this thing, right? But back then, there was a battle within this church about whether or not it was okay to eat meat after it had been sacrificed to an idol. Some people were saying, of course you can't do that. This stuff is defiled. It's been used in pagan worship practices. It's obviously tainted, and a good Christ follower would never pollute themselves with it. And the other team was saying, don't be silly. Actually, if you think about it, we follow the one true God. God isn't scared of idols or meat sacrifice to idols. Feel free. Eat, drink, be merry. Besides, idol meat is delicious. Seriously, you should try it. Nom, nom, nom. Well, the debate raged on. And Paul eventually decides to address it. And this is one of those scriptures, it sounds weird, this is my favorite scripture for a while. This scripture about some random thing eating food sacrificed to idols, it changed my life. It's a foundational scripture for me. And it's so foundational because at a time that I really needed it, it helped give me insight into one of my biggest blind spots as a person. And one of the biggest blind spots of the faith that had been handed down to me and that I had adopted as my own. Paul here does something devastating for someone who puts so much stock in being right. First, starts off pretty good. Paul affirms the argument, the right argument, as right. He says, oh yeah, this clearly is a good argument, and I stand there. He makes a ruling on the debate and says, in fact, it is okay to eat food sacrificed to idols. So concerning the actual food involved in these sacrifices to false god, Paul says, we know that a false god isn't anything in this world, and that there is no god except for the one god. Bam. Logic prevails. Take that, inferior point makers. Paul's on my side. He read it right. He sees the argument. He knows what's right. And for anyone who loves a good airtight argument, like myself, Feeling like Paul on your side is a really good feeling. Revel in that for just half a second, but don't get too stuck there because you're getting ready to have to eat it, okay? Trust me, guys. Uh, it, this, is, this is a tough one, and this is why I like it so much. Because Paul does something next that really lands a great gut punch. That is, if you let yourself get dragged into first century drama about food sacrifice to idols. <laughs> a kind of a niche audience, maybe, but hopefully I've invited you to be among it this morning. Paul says effectively, yeah, there's nothing wrong with eating food sacrificed to idols, but there is something profoundly wrong with eating anything that causes other people to betray their conscience. And food sacrificed to idols is exactly that thing. So... All of you self-righteous Corinthians, all of you who were technically right, guess what? Even though you were right and have a better argument, you are wrong. That hurts. To be the one with the right argument, to know that you're right, and then to be wrong. Even though, and in fact, because you were so right, you were wrong. There's something wrong with eating food sacrificed to idols when it hurts your brother or sister who thinks it's wrong. Doesn't that just stink? I think it really does. But Paul knew all the way back then, he knew the limits of an airtight, perfect argument. From within that system, it's really, really good, but taken next to real life and real people doesn't hold up the same way. He saw the appeal and the allure of being right and being certain, and he called it out as the idolatrous, sinful thing that it truly was. There were these people who were doing so good saying, oh no, that's not idolatrous, I can do this thing. And in that, they made an idol of something else and ended up unknowingly putting an idol before love and God. 
Sometimes being on the right side of an argument is not enough to make you right. Sometimes being on the right side of an argument is not enough to make you right. Please tell me somebody else here feels the sting of that, at least a little of the fraction that I feel it. Any of us who have ever been in a committed relationship might have run into this truth before. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> in fact, when Catherine and I were just married, we did a little tour and saw a bunch of people that had been married for a long time, seemingly happily, happily and we asked them, what is it that makes a relationship last? A lot of men of a certain age, especially, told me some variation of, you've got to learn, she's always right. <laughs> the yes, dear mentality. Has anybody ever heard that advice or given it? Yeah, yeah. I actually might have gotten it from a couple people in this room. Uh, and for me, early on in my marriage, I chafed at that idea. Of course, she's not always right. <laughs> of course, she's not. I'll argue anything to the death against anyone. I will. Certainly against those I hold most dear in life. I won't give up on my will like that. No way. If I'm right, I'll stick to that no matter what. Well, slowly, surely, the process of sanctification maybe, I think I'm starting to understand the wisdom behind that very foolish-seeming advice. And at best, it's not male or female, husband or wife related. It's a call to everyone in every kind of relationship. If you lay down your claim to being right, even if you are right, darn it, you might just stumble into some greater truth that you didn't know was there. Truly, the road to divorce court is paved with good argumentation. So is the road to civil war. So is the road to self-destruction and loneliness. Paul is offering us a different way, a gospel way of dealing with conflict here. He's saying that you don't have to get stuck in conflict. You don't have to become a slave to being right or to an airtight argument. Paul says, knowledge makes people arrogant, but love, that builds people up. Sure, good arguments have their place. Some of us don't need that reminder. But love offers us something that good arguments can't always. Love offers us perspective. From inside an airtight argument, love can suffocate to death. And two people can hold two good arguments against one another, and often they're both valid or have valid points, but sometimes the two holding them could never even connect enough to acknowledge that or to acknowledge one another. Err on the side of loving and listening. Maybe the world needs us to blast gospel truths on certain issues just louder than everyone else. Maybe our kids and our friends and our partners really need us to make some salient points about why we are so justified on our side of our arguments and in our own being. Or maybe, just maybe, that desire to be righter and more certain has been the very fuel for these destructive fires in the first place. Maybe that human urge to be right is what is burning our society and our relationships down. Maybe the people around us our friends in real life and on Facebook both, our families and our partners, maybe they don't really need more good arguments delivered with the weight of religious or self-righteous certitude on them. Maybe there's just enough toxic certitude in the air anyway. Maybe, just maybe, Paul was on to something here. The world needs the kind of non-toxic love that has the courage to lay down its claim to being right. It has the courage to love with a love that cuts deeper than any good argument ever could. That has the courage to be vulnerable in love with one another. It calls us to see each other. So my encouragement to us this week is to be a little less right this next week than you were last week. Assume the best in people that you disagree with, hear their heart, 
here or there hurt. Allow yourself to be a fool. The world needs that kind of prophetic witness right now. A vision of God's non-toxic love. The kind that knits us together. Friends, we are called to be that vision. Let it be so. Amen. I invite you now to stand uh, and join me in singing our hymn of response. may be seated. We come to that time in our service of worship in which we're able to lift up concerns that we have for people close at hand or far away or any other matters that we have for prayers today. Um, in my new concerns, uh, let me just start off with the one new concern that I have, and then I have uh, uh, three joys. Okay, uh, Rob, Fran, and Bobby Green are experiencing some health problems, and so they need our prayers, so please keep them in your prayers this week. And then the three joys, thank you for the rain last night. I got 1.23 inches over to Edwardsville. I just went out and looked, had about one and three quarters inches up here at the church garden, and my rain gauge was halfway blown over, so it might have been more than that. I'm not sure. And, uh, well, anyway, thank you for the rain. Today is Lyra Farrago's birthday. Congratulations, and that's a good, very appropriate since choir starts this coming Wednesday night at 7.30 in Kadoki. And somebody with the name of Judy and Charles Grant are celebrating their 51st wedding anniversary today. <laughs> and in light of Andy's sermon, I, I gotta share something here. Whenever I did uh, premarital counseling in my ministries, I always said to the couple, I said, now you've probably heard that marriage is a 50-50 proposition. I said, don't believe that. It's not. No, it's not. Marriage is more of a 90-10% proposition, or maybe even 99-1% proposition. Now, you get it your ways 10%, maybe 1% of the time, and you have to give 90% of the time. Now, if you are good in math, you might say, well, Pastor, that doesn't add up. I said, well, yeah, it does. <laughs> it adds up in this way, okay? Uh, each person maybe gets it right 
gets it their way 10% or 1% of the time, uh, and then 80% of the time you're compromising. 80 to 98% of the time you're compromising. So you go away from that feeling like you didn't get it your way. <laughs> that's one of those human conditions. You feel like you didn't get it your way. And uh, so that's one up on the other person, but it's really not. So you need to be aware of that as you go through that whole process there. Okay, and some other concerns that we have. Let's see if I can get my whole thing to move here. Uh, Bob and Carol Owens both have COVID, and um, they probably caught it waiting in the waiting room. Twice they had to be in the KU waiting room for all day long. Uh, so that's hospital is a good place to get sick, you know that? And Phyllis Lorian is asking for prayers for the Frank... Uh, Hoosby family, I think I pronounced that correctly. Frank was a lifetime family friend from Linwood, Kansas. He was riding on a motorized bicycle when he was hit by an SUV and killed. Frank was 69 years old, so I uh, want to remember that family in our prayers. So let us take our public concerns and our private concerns to Almighty God in a time of prayer. We'll start out with a, a time of silent prayer, then the pastoral prayer, and then we'll finish up with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you love us so much that you would give your only son to die on the cross for our salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins. But Lord, help us to understand also that you love the person who disagrees with us just as much that Jesus died on the cross just as much for their salvation and for their forgiveness. And help us to understand that just because we don't get it our way doesn't mean that it may not be a part of your way. Help us to be able to accept the limitations that we have in life, to accept the human condition that we do not know all things fully, only you do. And help us be aware that we constantly need to come to you and seek that forgiveness that you offer by your death upon the cross. Lord, we give you thanks for the rain that we've received. We give you thanks for the healing that we see in our, some of our people. And we pray for healing in others. We give you thanks when we're able to resolve some of our differences. And we pray that you will guide us through those times where we're still seeking to resolve differences, particularly within our churches, but also within the world, because we live in a world with many troubles, many problems, wars and rumors of wars, divisions within our country, our state, our communities, Lord, we pray that somehow your peace, your understanding might enter into us and we'd be able to live in that peace and that understanding. Lord, we thank you for being here and for your guidance for us, this congregation, this community, and in this world. We pray that you will continue. For all of this we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray with these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We invite the ushers to come forward at this time to receive this morning's tithes and offerings.
Almighty God, we give you thanks for all that you've given us. We return a portion to you to ask you to bless it and use it everywhere for your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. One more little comment on the marriage thingy there. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure that Judy would say that she got the 1% and I got the 10%. And that's because she had to follow me 10 times in 10 different moves <laughs> before she finally got to move to a house she could say was her house. Yeah. So uh, sometimes it works that way, sorry. Our closing hymn today, Lord, I want to be a Christian. Amen. I invite you to receive now our benediction. God, as we go forth from this place, sear onto our hearts a vision of your love. God, as we grow in you, make us a clear and clear vision of your love. Help us to be changed so that we can go out and change the world. In your name we pray. Amen.